So right now, I want to welcome our next guest to the program. We have Lieutenant General Tom Spohr, Director of the Center for Defense at the Heritage Foundation. Lieutenant General, thank you so much for being with us. Hey, thank you, Stacey. Glad to be here. You know, I love Heritage Foundation guests because you guys bring your A game to every conversation. And you are in my wheelhouse because I'm an Air Force veteran um, from from years ago. And so you're talking about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is actually making sure that our national defense apparatus is up to snuff, especially during the coronavirus pandemic and our response to it. Let's talk about your piece. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, uh, Stacey. So there's it was kind of written in response to a number of people that have been suggesting that, hey, we got this coronavirus going on. What we need to do is reduce our defense spending, reduce our readiness of our military, and really concentrate on this pandemic and preparing for future pandemics. And the pandemic is indeed horrible, and uh, we do need to prepare for future pandemics. My piece argues that uh, America, as a big global power with interests and all over the world can't can't take its eye off the ball can't just turn inward and work on preparing for future pandemics that we need to be able to keep a strong military and uh, prepare for pandemics and i think the folks that are suggesting hey it's time to cut the military are the ones that probably were suggesting that same thing even before there was any coronavirus so lieutenant general you the point you're making is Absolutely. What we we need to be talking about this. And the reason I agree with you is because um, there's this this kind of thing that that we see people doing where we get tunnel vision about a problem. And so everything else has to go to the wayside. The, The reason we're having such a tough time in the economy is because everyone said we can't do anything but pay attention to COVID-19 and dealing with it. And so we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We should be able to keep our national defense apparatus up at the highest level while dealing with the pandemic, while opening our economy and getting Americans back to work. And that's just three things we need to do, right? No, I'm with you 100%. And so big country, you know, we spend in the federal budget about 15% every year on uh, the defense. And that's kind of a small investment to make uh, to keep our country strong and to protect our interests worldwide. And so you know, it, it's natural in the uh, in the in the midst of a natural national emergency to say, "Hey, gosh, oh my, we need to spend more. We need to do more." Uh, the country's already, as best as we can find, spending about thirteen uh, billion dollars a year in bio preparedness. You know, preparing for either bio weapons or uh, pandemics like this, and that's a lot of money. Now, is it the right amount of money? I'm not certain, but I do know that before we start spending a bunch more, we need to make sure that the $13 billion we're spending every year is actually going to the right things. And I, I am not currently certain of that right now. So I, I'm not either. In fact, I think, so the, the, the driver behind how we deal with COVID-19 has not been the number of deaths or um, the number of PPE that is either not there or needs to be ordered or where it's coming from. It has been journalists and the media and their coverage of every word that comes out of the mouth of whether it's the president or uh, Fauci or Burks or any number of talking heads on MSNBC and CNN. So basically inept people who aren't good at their jobs and don't have any skill sets in any other area are determining the direction of the conversation when the adults in the room, like yourself, could be actually dominating the conversation with facts about what we need to do. Like in your piece at the Washington Times, You say, despite being ranked first of 195 countries in global health security and annual federal expenditures of hundreds of millions of dollars on infectious disease preparedness, COVID-19 has claimed tens of thousands of American lives. So you're recommending an after action evaluation to identify a number of areas where the country as a whole can improve our preparedness and then promptly fix the issues. I haven't heard anything like what you just wrote there on any channel ever. No one's talking about what you just said there. Yeah, but it's, it's the way we're trained, as you know, as an Air Force veteran, it's the way we're trained to think about things is, so what, what are we learning? How can we do this better? You know, so we know there's going to be a next pandemic because that's history shows us that. What can we get right? And, and it's about more than just making sure that we have enough mass and things like that. We need to make sure that the right people have the responsibility assigned to them and that 
uh, and that they're doing what they need to do. So if we decide that we want more masks in our strategic national stockpile, we figure out what that number is, and then we figure out who's the person to make sure we always have those kinds of masks in the proper quantities. And right now it's just kind of the conversation just ricochets around to trying to find who's to blame for something. And, you know, finding blame is a wonderful Washington, D.C. kind of parlor game. But what we really want to do is is uh, get this right and so that we don't have this kind of severe impact that we're having in the middle of COVID-19. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting about what you just said there is – um, it dovetails in with what you're talking about in your piece a little further down. You you go into the threats that existed before coronavirus hit. So it, this was something that I've seen highlighted just a few different places um, where people talk about the fact that people still get cancer, heart disease. People are still having cavities and needing root canals. I mean, the, the issues that we've all had from before hip replacements, knee replacements, and that's just in the medical field. You mentioned China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. They all posed growing existential threats to the United States security before this. They still pose those threats. They haven't gone away. We haven't magically addressed those under the, the radar of dealing with COVID-19. So, I mean, what, what would you like to see happen? You know, as we begin to turn back to normalcy, we need to turn back to normalcy pretty quickly because these threats have probably been maybe even festering at a faster rate because we've been so focused on one single issue. I mean, you're exactly right. We're seeing, you know, evidence that China is kind of taking advantage of the distraction of the United States, and they're pushing against their neighbors in the South China Sea, like Malaysia and the Philippines, and they're trying to in- encroach on their mining and their fishing rights because they know the United States right now is consumed with this crisis. And so the, the bad behavior that China and Russia and the, and the people you named has not gone away, and in some cases I think it's gotten worse. And what we don't need to do is now, you know, decide that pandemics is the only thing that the United States needs to prepare for. We need to take a balanced view. And so as we get out from under this COVID thing, we need to look around at the world and say, OK, where where should we best invest uh, to protect our country? And preparing for pandemics is certainly something we should do, but we can't afford to let our military degrade like it did in the, uh, especially the latter half of the Obama administration. We can't, we can't do that again and then have to go through the painful process of rebuilding it again. Uh, and so this is one of those situations where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure because it's so much more expensive to go back and build back up as opposed to simply maintaining on a yearly basis. And I'm, I'm not a war hawk. I don't believe in nation building. I'm, I'm so exhausted by our continued presence in, in such a huge number over in the Middle East. But that doesn't mean that I don't understand the need for us to maintain and support our military infrastructure because I, I used to work with crew chiefs. And there's nothing worse than not being able to get a part for an aircraft and having that aircraft be persistently broken on the reports. And it becomes almost a, a, the butt of a joke that that tail number can't go up and it can't perform missions. So instead of having, you know, 30 aircraft, you really have 29. Functionally, you have 29. And that's that's the one that you can't get parts for. But maybe the other two that are persistent broken. You're not sure why exactly these two planes, you keep examining it. And I'm in my little office looking at Excel spreadsheets and all these different data from online where crew chiefs have input why the thing is broken, why they think it keeps breaking. But the, the issue is you have to dig all the way down and find that faulty part and replace it with something that will not degrade during flight so that it can continue to be functional. And that's just talking about one specific type of an aircraft on work that I did, you know, I won't say how many years ago when I was on active duty in the Air Force. So these are problems that are very real and they have to be addressed. And that's every part of every supply chain and every branch of the military and all of the equipment and people resources as well that have to be continually trained and maintained and kept at the ready as well. No, I mean, you're exactly right. If you let these things uh, degrade and they start getting really bad and it costs much more than if you had always just kept them at a steady level of funding. I mean, there were reports about people having to get aircraft parts out of museums off old aircraft because the part system had just dried up for lack of funding. And we don't want to go back uh, to that uh, situation. You know, So we're spending a lot right now. The deficit's high. The debt's getting higher. You know, defense should be a part of, of making the government 
more efficient, and I and I think we can probably squeeze some more savings out of the Pentagon. But what we don't need to do is really slash the Pentagon and bring ourselves back to the the days we had in the in the latter years of the Obama administration. Well, it and it's important to note that the president doesn't get any credit for rebuilding the military. The 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 uh, talking heads don't cover it. They don't talk about how much easier it is for people who are serving in our armed forces to do their jobs because they now have not just the funding but the support and the mechanisms to do those jobs. That's now all back in place where it was se- severely lacking in, in the Obama administration. And that's why it's so important what you do, writing over at the Heritage Foundation and, and all of the the policy papers and the the actual hard, heavy lifting that you guys do there. We're so appreciative of it. And, and your time today, Lieutenant General. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Stacey. Happy to be here. Hey, have a great weekend. You too. All right. So that was Lieutenant General Tom Spore of the Heritage Foundation. I've just tweeted out his article. I would recommend that you read it. It's a great resource. Um, those Washington Times columns that, that uh, Heritage Foundation people do, when you read those, it just puts a little bit of information in your arsenal. Um, sometimes, and it's, it's really funny because sometimes I'll read an article and I think, wow, that's interesting. And, um, but it doesn't even occur to me that it might be useful later. And then someone, it, it's almost like clockwork. Someone will say to me, sometimes it's a stranger. I have no idea why people are so obsessed with spending you know, on yada, 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 or what's the big deal with doing so-and-so. It doesn't hurt anybody. And that's when that little couple of nuggets of information from the article that I read they come in so handy because I can then say, well, actually, I just read a piece, um, you know, and it, it explained that. And I, I'll share a couple of facts in a non-combatant way. I just share them. And I'll say just, you know, I'm just responding, you know, to what you said. I'm just sharing that, um, you know, give it a thought. And, and then that's it. And then the next thing I know that person is saying to me, oh, wow, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I'll, I might take, take a look at that. Um, or where was that? And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll read the piece myself. And then that's it. So instead of trying to convince them that they're wrong and you're right, or convince them to come over to a different way of thinking, just giving them a couple of tidbits of, of information and then letting them go off and find the information for themselves. And I've actually had people say to me, oh, wow, I actually have seen some of your stuff online. And I, you know, I didn't, I, I thought you might be much more combative. Thanks for giving me a little bit of information. 